Good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Espacio Fundación Telefónica. I'm Pablo González. I'm part of the team of uh, culture, uh, uh, digital culture of the Telefónica Foundation, and I wanted to thank you and to welcome you to one more session of this cycle where we are working together to the uh, together with the Aspen Institute about technology and society this is our third session in this cycle and what we are seeing or looking at in each of the session is uh, uh, try to understand the fundamental changes that society is going through as a consequence of this technological disruption. The first session that we had together with Ryan Aben, who is the, uh, an editor of The Economist, we looked at all the changes that had to do with the future of working, the labor market, the employment market, technology is changing that and having a huge impact on the labor market. The second event that we had together with Darío Gil, He's a Spaniard from Murcia. He's a vice president of uh, science and technology at IBM, the highest uh, ranking uh, uh, official uh, officer in, in, in uh, IBM, a Span Spanish one, I mean, a Spanish person. And uh, we were talking about that uh, field where there, there's going to be a huge change, uh, ethical uh, uh, issues that are going to appear. And we also discussed uh, and, and quantic uh, um, uh, computing and we have today Connie Joel to talk about education something that uh, is a little bit closer to us here at Fundación Telefónica but which is also a topic that is going to change radically in the future through the use of technology. I wanted to thank uh, Connie for uh, her presence uh, here and thank her for her talk. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sure that is going to be very interesting. I will turn the floor over to Yaris Velázquez uh, from Aspen and uh, he will introduce her a little bit um, uh, more extensively and that's all. I hope that you enjoy Enjoy this talk. There will be a brief uh, a speech or a brief presentation on the part of uh, Connie, and then Maria Zavala will uh, hold an, an exchange with her uh, to uh, uh, a Q&A session. I want also to thank uh, um, uh, the journalist for being here and for uh, helping us with this uh, um, interview. And I would also like to thank Aspen for having trusted us to uh, work together with us in this uh, project. We are delighted to work with you. Uh, it is very easy, really, to work with you, and it is also very enriching, and I hope that this same feeling also conveys in what you are going to see here today. Thank you very much, and I turn the floor over to Luis. Thank you, Pablo, and thank you all for attending this conference. I'm David Blatkez. I'm the uh, uh, manag uh, man uh, program manager of uh, the Aspen Institute in Spain and so uh, he has said almost everything so I'm just going to take uh, a couple of minutes. Uh, first, thank you for being here. I invite you to, if you are not uh, one of our uh, regulars, to continue coming and having a look. Uh, you can also watch it through the internet and uh, we are looking at the different aspects of life that are going to change through the uh, impact of technology, the future of education, the future of uh, uh, digital world, and the uh, future of labor, and so on. Then we will have a, a, a day with Eli Pariser to see how Internet defines our uh, mental spectrum and our through the search tools that we are using. They are all fascinating topics. I don't want to take any more time uh, from uh, Connie, as, uh, and she's been years working. I guess that you looked at her, her biography, but she has been working in the world of education for a long time, in, and more specifically on how the technological changes change the way in, uh, in which we learn. Uh, she is managing a budget that for us is uh, really uh, unimaginable uh, in ter when it comes to education and that should make us think a little bit um, and in these last uh, few years he is leading the an initiative, uh, she is going to talk about the collective shift where she works with uh, schools, with uh, companies, with uh, cities, communities implementing the way or the different uh, new ways of learning uh, for young people. She's going to tell us about all that and a, a, a lot more and Cody you have the floor. Good 
Good evening. Thank you, David, and thank you, Pablo. It's really wonderful, both of the Telefonica Foundation and of Aspen, to have me here. And I'm just thrilled to be able to spend the evening with you and to talk a little bit about things that are near and dear to my heart, like the future of education. So as David said, I've been working in the field of education for basically my entire adult life. And up until about the last five years, um, you know, we've really been trying very hard to improve what education and learning looks like for our young people. And when I started, that work was really about improving what our current system looks like. And about five years ago, the nature of the work and the conversations really shifted. So when I started, we were asking questions like, how can I make my teaching a little bit more engaging for the kids in my classroom? How can I organize my classroom better? How can I make my school more efficient? How can we create a nationalized curriculum so that all of our kids are having the same learning opportunities? And we were able to ask these questions because the outcome of education was very clear. Right? The goal of education across the world, one of its primary functions has always been to make sure that we're producing productive citizens, that we're preparing our kids for a productive future. For schools, with parents, the work has always been to make sure that our young people and our children are growing up to be productive and successful adults and that they can participate in our economy to make sure that our countries have productive growth, right? And it actually hasn't been that hard historically to be able to map what our economy and our workforce needs are, to understand what the skills and competencies are to be successful in our workforces, and then to be able to teach that in schools. Right, 200 years ago, it was pretty clear. Our economies were very much built on farming and agriculture. And we knew that in our schools, we needed to make sure that our kids could read and write and do some math. And then it, you know, we had the next industrial revolution. And we moved from agriculture to factories. And we still needed to make sure that our kids could read and write and do math, but they needed to have some knowledge in the disciplines and areas where we were producing out of our factories. They also had to have some core behaviors. They had to be able to show up on time. They had to be punctual. They had to be able to follow orders, right, in order to work in factories. And in fact, our schools even started looking like factories. Whether it's here, the United States, or across the world, this is a classroom in China. Right? We've organized our schools to be very efficient so that we can get thousands of kids in the door at a particular time, make sure they're learning a core set of things, and then get them out the door and get them ready for the world of work in a mass production economy. But now let's fast forward to 2017. We're in the 21st century. And I kind of have to ask, what in the world is happening in the world of work? Right, so we as educators, what we're hearing are jobs are changing dramatically. Technology is infusing all of work, whether it's in factories, in the office, or around the globe. The United Nations put out a report recently that said in 20 years, half of the world's jobs will be gone. Two billion jobs. At the same time, economists who are surveying employers around the world tell us that our employers say, 40% of our employers say that they have jobs for which they can't find skilled employees. Right? We call this a skills gap. In the United States, our companies are now spending more money on the training of their employees than all the money that's spent in higher education by our government and universities combined. That's an indicator that something's a little bit off. And it's even harder for our young people. Right, I know here in Spain there's a youth unemployment rate in the United States and some of our cities it's up to 50%. That both risks the independence and health of our young people 
And as importantly, because jobs are changing so quickly in the 21st century, disconnect from employment means that you're going to have a very hard time, if not impossible, ever catching up. So we risk their long-term employment. But then as educators, we say, OK, you've told me that jobs are changing quickly. You've told me that our employer employment sector and our growth depends on our kids having skills and competencies. So what skills and competencies do you need? Right? What are the jobs of the future so that I, as an educator, can help prepare our young people for them? So what's the common response to that? It's actually, we, well, we don't know, right? We don't know what the jobs are for the future. For educators, it leads us into feeling a little bit like we're chasing our tails. It's a head scratcher, right? This is really the first time in the history of education that we're being asked to prepare our young people for an unknown future. It's a bit of a conundrum. And so what that has meant for me as an educator is to say, well, OK, I better start understanding this technology. I better un start understanding, at least in a general way, how it's going to impact the future of the children that I'm trying to prepare. And so what I've done as an educator is to start spending a lot of time reading, listening to, and meeting some of the best technologists in the world. Right, whether it's Elon Musk or Ursula Burns or Lucy Peng from China or Cheryl Stan 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 Sandberg, we have to start as educators jumping in to what's happening in technology innovation space so that we can have a better idea of what to do and how to prepare our young people for the future. So one of the technologists who's been super helpful with this is Kevin Kelly, who's up here, and he's the founder of Wired. And Kevin Kelly suggests that we start thinking about technology and the future patterns of technology, because we really just want to prepare our young people for the broad patterns of what's going to happen. We think about it like rain. Right? On the one hand, if you think about a raindrop, it's impossible to predict the path of that raindrop. Right? It's not predictable. But rain, rain falls. Right? We know what's going to happen with rain. So too with technology. There are some technology innovations that are simply inevitable, and there are some that are not so. So on the one hand, internet, inevitable. Twitter, not so inevitable. Didn't have to happen. The cell phone, inevitable. The iPhone, not so inevitable. Putting our data into the cloud, inevitable. Amazon Web Services, not so predictable. So then that raises the question, what's the next big innovation that's going to happen? What's the next big innovation that's going to have a massive impact on our kids and on the jobs that we need to prepare them for? Well, it turns out that that innovation is actually already here. It's artificial intelligence. Right? And so for educators, what that has also meant for me is, OK, I get it. The next big revolution is going to be around artificial intelligence. I believe that. I've heard it from all the technology folks. I've been studying my technology. I don't really know what artificial intelligence is. And I don't really know how it's going to impact. So let's take a deeper dive into artificial intelligence. At its core, and there are two prob we have two big challenges in understanding artificial intelligence. The first is that science fiction has sort of owned the story on artificial intelligence, right? Is it going to be that we're going to be overrun with robots? I don't know that that's inevitable. In fact, because what artificial intelligence is, is in technology that simply makes us smarter. So we're already deeply engaged with artificial intelligence. Google is artificial intelligence, right? Google actually is a massive memory bank. I often refer to Google as my third brain. GPS, Netflix actually use artificial intelligence. GPS makes us much easier for us to figure out where we're going. And Netflix, by and large, makes us much smarter about the different kinds of movies we pick. Calculators. Who here uses calculators? Calculators are artificial intelligence. Right? So once we start getting a handle on artificial intelligence, the other problem is that it, we're not always certain 
about what intelligence is, not just the artificial part, but what intelligence is. Right, so many of us think about intelligence as being a single continuum. And we either have more of it or less of it. Chicken has less of it. Many of us in the room have a little bit more of it. Einstein's of the world have a lot of it, right? 30 years ago, a psychologist named Howard Gardner postulated that actually we have multiple kinds of intelligence, right? That it's not just one continuum, that we have verbal, mathematical, kinesthetic, interpersonal. 30 years later, now that we have all of this technology to study the brain, it turns out that he was right. Intelligence is much more like a symphony, right? Symphony is made up of thousands of individual notes that all get played and then layered together. That's what artificial intelligence is doing. It is figuring out bit by bit what those notes are through millions of pieces of data, incredible amounts of repetition, right? And it's just figuring out note by note and beginning to layer them. And once it layers them enough, it sticks it into something to make it smarter, like a car. That, in essence, is what artificial intelligence is. As an educator, I'm still trying to figure out, OK, got that. How's that going to impact my kids that I'm teaching? Well, let's go back to the last industrial revolution. What was the last industrial revolution particularly good at? Right, when we think about the steam engine, when we think about electricity, when we think about fossil fuel, the last industrial revolution at its core made manual labor easier. Right? We figured out as humans how to harness power so that we no longer, if we wanted to go from Barcelona to Madrid, we didn't have to walk. We could drive or fly. Right? We could use the steam engine to transport huge amounts of resources from one place to the next. We can use our finger to flip a switch to make electricity go on. And our jobs as humans was to manage that power in an incredibly efficient way. And many of our jobs, the tasks we performed, are all about managing power efficiently. So now let's think about it. What's artificial intelligence going to be good at? Turns out, it's good at efficiency, right? And it's good at production. So artificial intelligence, as we move into, and we're, in the, we're already starting it, as we move into this third industrial massive revolution in how we work, what artificial intelligence is going to do is take all of the jobs and the tasks that are about efficiency and repetition. And on the one hand, that's super exciting, right? Because who wants to do all those repetitive tasks? On the other hand, oh my god, those are all our jobs, right? So how do we begin to think about this? So when you think about it, artificial intelligence, think about the car. First indust the second industrial revolution, we went from the horse to 250 horsepower. In this next revolution, we are going from 250 horsepower to 250 horsepower plus 250 mines. It's going to be much smarter. We are not going to have to manage efficiency. So then, what do we do? Right, that leads us to the next two questions that I think as educators we absolutely have to answer. The first question is, how do we work with efficiency? What does that look like? What are the tasks? What are the jobs that go along with working with efficiency? Because we had to figure out how we worked with power. Now we have to figure out how we work with efficiency. The second thing we have to figure out is what are we as humans particularly good at? We've just spent the last hundred years getting really good at managing efficiency. It turns out we don't have to do that. So what is it we're good at? Well, I'll tell you one thing we're good at. We're really good at failure. Right? Think about it. Failure is something that we do particularly well, and failure is incredibly inefficient, right? What is science? Science requires lots of failure. What is innovation? Innovation requires enormous amounts of failure. There's even this motto about fail fast, fail often, fail cheaply. 
Creativity, arts, culture. Lots of failure and inefficiency. Relationships. Who here hasn't had a failed relationship? Right? These are all the things that we as humans are particularly good at. And this is where our, these are where all of our jobs are going to be in the future. Right? These are the things that we have got to start preparing our young people for. In terms of what this next industrial revolution is going to bring. And so if we have that general pattern and that general understanding of really what the future at a high pattern level looks like, now let's go back to this question of what's the future of education and talk about that for a little bit. And I'm take the same approach that I've taken with technology, which is to say I think that there are at least three inevitable patterns or shifts that are going to happen in the future of education. And then I'm going to talk about a few that I, are, I think are probable but not inevitable. The first one is that we are going to shift from our factory model of preparing pipelines of students to go into factories and we're going to shift dramatically to personalized learning. Right, so right now we have all of our kids sitting in rows all learning the same thing. In a time when efficiency is taken care of and repetition is taken care of, we're going to be in a world that's flexible, adaptive and customizable. Right? And we're going to live in a world that's constantly changing. Constantly changing world means that I have to constantly be a learner. It will my learning will never end. And I'm going to be empowered and have a lot of agency around making lots of decisions around that flexibility and that adaptation and managing lots of failure. That's going to require lots of individualized learning for me as the learner. And it doesn't matter that it, how long it's going to take, right? Because we're in a time of uh, the inefficiency is what we're good at. So we're going to shift dramatically into everyone having individualized learning plans that they're going after in their own way. Second big shift. I don't know if those of you who are not educators have noticed, but we organize all of schooling around time. In fact, when we shifted into the industrial age, we created this term called seat time. And really, we measure whether or not you've completed something by how long the student has actually sat in the chair. Literally, that's what we do. So if you think about it, how is a class organized? We all have this general sense of a class is so many minutes, right? We have a general sense that a school day lasts so long. We know where our kids are. A school year lasts so long. When we finish so many grades, we're done, right? In the future, we won't be organizing things by time. time the organization by time is, again, is about being efficient. And that's not what's going to matter. We are instead going to organize all of our learning by competency. Right? We're all going to take our own paths to building our skills and competency. It's not going to matter how long it takes. It's that we've developed that skill and competency. And all of our education will be organized around those competencies. Third big one. Where does learning happen today? It happens in a school system. Right? So we talk about le learning is organized happens in a particular building, at a particular time of day, and in a particular way. If we're all going to be lifelong learners, that can't possibly be right. right? If we're going to be moving towards personalized learning that is competency driven, we're going to need to be learning all the time everywhere. And so we'll be shifting from schools to an ecosystem. An ecosystem that takes advantage of all of the learning abundance that lives in you, in our communities, in our cities and online. And what technology is going to need to do for us is connect it in a way that has meaning for each of us individually. I think these three things are absolutely inevitable and will happen over the next 10 to 15 years. It raises some other questions. So what happens to curriculum? Right? You know, in all honesty, I don't know what happens to curriculum, but I will confess that my not knowing something has never stopped me from talking, so I'm just going to keep going. We're betting and we're thinking, particularly in our work in LRNG, that curriculum is going to shift to playlists or pathways. And that learning will be organized in kind of these bite-sized units. Think about Legos. You have Legos? 
Legos are little pieces that can be connected together to form any kind of shape. Learning is going to be organized in these containers that can be mixed and matched and connected so that they are connected in ways that work for each of you individually, but then build towards a set of competencies. And so we won't be thinking, of, in the future, we won't be thinking about curriculum as we currently do. What about diplomas? So I have a diploma from about 20 years ago. Now ask me, is that diploma really relevant if I were to look for a job tomorrow? Not so much. I actually think my diploma should be expired, right? Because the world is going to be changing that quickly. And if we think about building towards competency, and if we think about rapid change, we're going to need what we call, might call micro-credentials. In our work, we refer to them as badges. When you click on one of these badges, it opens up an enormous amount of information, right? Because we're in the digital age. So you can click on that badge and you can learn, if you click on the Mozilla badge, you can learn where the young person, what they learned, where they learned it, what standards it aligns to, and it contains the evidence that they actually, of performance, that they actually learned that competency. Right? And as we think about the ecosystem and learning everywhere, we'll be collecting artifacts or representations of our learning. We'll be all creating our own portfolios that we're carrying around that consist of these kinds of badges or micro-credentials. Again, already in the works. Teachers. What happens to teachers? Right now, in most of our schools, we still have classrooms where teachers stand up at the front and do what I'm doing now, which is talk to a group of students. The premise of that is that the teacher is the expert, the student is the novice, and the teacher can pour in the information that everybody in the room needs to know. Again, incredibly efficient. Horrible for learning. There's nothing to do with how to learn. It has to do with how to efficiently get information from one person out to a bunch of different people. Right? That's going to shift. And as we move again towards personalized learning that's competency-based, our teachers are going to become mentors and advocates. They're going to be the co-designers of the pathways and the playlists that our young people are moving through. And when I say co-designers, I mean they'll be co-designing with the learners themselves, as opposed to just telling them as expert what they need to know. They may become mentors, we may call them advocates, I don't know what we'll call them, but the role will be clear in terms of support and guide and advocacy. And we won't need fewer teachers, we'll actually need many more teachers. Right? Again, efficiency doesn't matter now. So when you look at the person to the left of you and the person to the right of you, in the future you will all both be learners and teachers as we move forward in the future of education and learning. And so this is really, this may seem like it's very far off. It may seem like a bit of a science fiction fantasy, but actually it's already happening. So part of what I do with my organization, LRNG, is we're working in 10 cities in the United States to do exactly this work. We work with the employers in those cities. The employers are beginning to describe to us the skills and competencies that they need in order to employ young people in order to employ the future workforce. We back map that into playlists. We take learning experiences from libraries and museums and from online and from schools, and we organize them into customized playlists for young people that lead to those competencies, that then can lead to jobs or employability. It's nascent, it's beginning work, it's super hard. But we're starting to build these maps and ecosystems in our cities. And I would say the one thing that we've probably learned more than anything, in addition to it being hard work, is that for it to be successful, it requires that everyone participates. Right? Learning no longer belongs just to the school or is just the teacher's responsibility. It becomes all of our responsibility. So I want to end by saying I really look forward to working with you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hola. 
Buenas tardes. Hello, good afternoon, everyone, or good evening now. As, you have, as we've already said, thank you for coming. If you have friends that aren't here and you think that it could be interesting for them, send them a message and recall them that they can follow it on streaming. And for the ones that are here and are following it online, please keep in mind that you can share your opinion and especially questions using the hashtag uh, tech society to participate this is what also this is what this is about it does this is, does not depend on a few but on all we are all involved in improving how children learn and even how we learn so the more we participate the better Connie thank you thank you very much it has been very interesting I would like to ask you, how do you think that you can convince us that everything that you've told us is not science fiction and it is really feasible? That's your first question. <laughs> um, so, there are a couple parts of that. So, I've, so let me first talk about convincing. So I've worked in the innovation space and technology for the last 10 to 15 years. And one of the things that I've learned is that, particularly in the world of education, it is impossible to make uh, progress by pushing change on people. And that the best thing that we can do is create examples that then others see and want to pull. And they say, oh, that's amazing. I want to do that. And so part of our work, the best way for me to convince you is to actually do it. And so that's part of our work in our 10 cities, is we're going to spend the next couple of years actually doing this. So much so that in two years you're going to come to me and say, please, work, let me do that. And so that's part of what's absolutely critical about, as we think about making such dramatic changes. Like you would have thought the changes in the workforce were science fiction, except they're all happening, mm. and you see them. Mm. And so I think for us as adults, not so much for the kids, but for us as adults, we have to see it and feel it and know that it exists and then we'll believe it. Una de las cosas más interesantes que has dicho es que tenemos... One of the most interesting things that you've said is that we all have to assume a shift in how we not only understand the learning process, but also the word learning. We should uh, make learning a way of life and not a concept that, for example, involves learning. The, the, the kid considers that he goes to school not only to learn, but to pay attention, to study and to accomplish a result. Uh, how we can accomplish to uh, spread the wish of learning? Maybe we are in uh, a little bit um, stuck, we're a little, a little bit overwhelmed, and it's a little bit to understand uh, learning as a pleasant, pleasant experience. What, we, what can we do to spread this, uh, this enthusiasm uh, experience uh, towards our children? One of the hardest things, because and uh, when I started this work again 10 or 15 years ago, we consciously shifted from using the word education to using the word learning, because everybody has this understanding of education as something that happens in a building, and that it's something that you have to do, and we really think that learning is something we live, um, and I don't know if there are any brand people in here, but we often talk about learning as a lifestyle. It just needs to be a part of everything that you do. So the, the only way to begin to, I think, have that sense is to make folks more reflective and conscious of when they are learning in their everyday life. So we are not all, we as general society, are, both our kids and us as adults, are not always aware of our experience of getting better at something. So there's a psychologist, um, his name is Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. Um, at the University of Chicago, and he has spent his life studying this thing called flow. Mm. And flow is this notion of when you're really deep into something you care about, you sort of have this feeling of just being in the flow. And that's what ideal learning is. It's having a challenge that's not too hard and not too easy that you're totally focused on doing. Mm. And so we have to create It, and it's not going to start in, if we can do it in schools, that's great. But this happens to us all the time, whether we're at a library or a museum, whether or not we're trying to get better at a sport. And so as a, uh, the, I think we have to raise our consciousness of 
that's learning. Mm. And we have to start naming learning in all the places where it's happening. Muchas veces cuando hablamos de aprendizaje conectado Many times when we speak about connected learning, this is what we are chasing here, we uh, confuse the term with which would be a uh, connected uh, teaching or with the use of, of technology in the classroom or the presence of uh, children in the technological world. I would like you to tell us about uh, this concept of learning, of connected learning, um, be, beyond a specific example, what is, the, what is this? And it kind of goes back to this notion of flow a little bit. So uh, in uh, I've had the privilege of being able to fund and support very large-scale studies um, of young people and how they participate in learning and how they participate with digital media. And one of the things, more than a thousand kids that we've studied um, and watched learn, we have found that there are three things that have to absolutely be connected that's common to all robust learning experiences. And three things have to be connected for the learner, and this is what we mean by connected learning. It's when the thing that you really care about getting better at, the thing that you're interested or passionate about, is connected to a peer group who shares that interest and is also trying to get better at it. And what you're trying to get better at is then connected to something in the real world. And when those three things come together, we see incredible learning happen. We say kids persisting through incredible challenges And uh, we, in education, we like to use this phrase called time on task. Mm -hmm. We see kids spending hours and hours and hours trying to get better and to learn. And what, unfortunately, and this is where connected learning gets confused with the technology, is what we also found from the, those kids that we spent enormous amounts of time with, it turns out to be really hard to bring those three things together and that they often live in different institutions or in different places. Mm. And so then we've started this conversation about how do we connect those experiences of those institutions so that kids fundamentally have this learning experience. Mm. Vamos a intentar poner un ejemplo práctico. Let's try to put a practical example of this connected learning in which a uh, kid that has a passion can connect with other people that share this passion and thanks to this connection and uh, this passion can be translated into something from real life it can take him to uh, be uh, to, 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 to work and to, to, to get an effort um, let's use a practical example could you put a practical example please you too and I'll give you one without technology and, and one with technology so the one we are all most familiar with I think is sports so if you think about playing on a sports team and if you care about let's I suspect soccer is something that we're all familiar with here so if you really care, let's imagine that you're an athlete that you really care about getting better at soccer you have a shared group your team that's trying to get better at it with you, and you have the promise of a potential soccer career, or in the United States, a potential scholarship to a university, or at a minimum, you've got the, the promise of potentially getting to the next level of a team, right? And so that, in, in, in that effort to try to get better at soccer and learning those skills is a connected learning experience. Mm -hmm. Some of the things that we have done in our work um, that we have found translate into jobs, um, it's not uncommon that kids are passionate about music, right? And so in some of our libraries and our museums, we have created music label programs. So they can come in and record, everybody wants to be a hip hop artist. They come in and that's really what they're passionate or interested in. As soon as you start laying out for those young people, then you know these are all of the skills and competencies that go into the music industry. It can be graphic design, it can be studio engineering, it can be sound engineering, it's writing of spoken word. Then our young people are building all of those skills and competencies and they know that they may publish a blog. They may be able to go and work in a sound recording studio. There are whole sets of things that they can do that we connect them to. And so that's like that's an example of a passion that's a playlist actually that's a passion that gets connected to building a whole set of skills that may not even be necessary for that passion but we know will open up a world of work and opportunity for young people that can then be moved into work. Comentabas antes que esta labor de impulsar You were saying that uh, fostering um, 
learning with, uh, with an important focus on, on children is not uh, a task uh, from uh, the teacher, but we are all involved in that. Does this mean that we are all have to be updated about the new reality that we are living with the aim of contributing uh, our children the, the, the strength that they need? <laughs> yes. Y en el caso de los profesores. Yeah. yeah. And in the case of teachers, parts of that that I think are just absolutely critical, and it's it's in part because of the shift that our digital media tools are occasioning, and that is that work is changing. Um, because of when you think about the music industry, the business industry, the retail sector, all of these things are changing because of the way that we're now using our digital media tools in a variety of different ways. If we as adults are not literate and aren't participating, it is then impossible to guide and help our young people. And so we really, even at the level of just understanding and participating in all of the digital media, in addition to understanding where the work is going, We all have to become learners, and we all have to start participating in order to make sure that we're preparing our young people as best we can. ¿Y cómo entra, si estamos If we understand learning, uh, not, as a, not as a game, but something funny, so to speak, that is this our goal with children, how could we fit um, game per se, or gaming, or all experiences that technology um, includes through game with children, no matter how this game is? I think this may be a, an answer to that question. <laughs> One of the findings from all of our research, um, in part, uh, we often, I think, as adults, think of um, finding your interest or your passion as something that's just innate and it appears. Turns out that that's not actually the case. When we really watch young people progress, we, we sort of saw the sequence of activities that we called hanging out, messing around, and geeking out. And really, what young people and kids need, and we, we see elementary and we enable uh, little kids to do this quite well. We don't let adolescents do it so well. Is that you have to have time to be a learner. You have to have time just to hang out and be with your social community, right? To have that feeling of belonging and be a part of them and to see what they're doing. Maybe to look over their shoulder, to understand what's going on in your community. And you might see something interesting that they're doing. A brother might show a sister, or a cousin might be doing something, or a friend might be doing something. I don't know, it, in the United States we have lots of kids playing soccer, but actually they're also doing fun, really fun stuff around the game that they're sharing with each other. And so you might be doing something that I'm interested in, and I say, oh hey, let me look at that, and I start tinkering, or playing. Like we have to, as learners, we have to be able to mess around. Tinkering and play are a fundamental part of learning, Because that's where you're just kind of goofing around, you're making mistakes, there aren't any risks. And the more you do that, the more you think, oh, I actually want to get better at this. This is interesting to me. And then you start moving into that quote-unquote geeking out phase where you actually want to go deep and learn a ton about it. But we, for all of us, we have to have these opportunities to explore and to tinker and to play. Because that's a fundamental part of figuring out both what we're interested in and learning. Los estudios, eh, prácticamente en todos los países, nos dicen que los... Researches in all countries tell us that uh, children have a relationship with technology like a further step in the development of their passions. They like Lego, they watch uh, Lego videos. They like uh, uh, dolls, they watch uh, videos that have to do with dolls or they play with uh, APPs that have to do with these passions. Uh, when they grow up, their digital life uh, focuses on their social life. And maybe the perception that we have is that they set aside the learning path that uh, could that they could have through technology. The ones that surround these people are afraid of uh, technological life of our children. So what can we do to uh, foster it positively towards learning? A hugely important question, um, and it comes out of. Um, a, a, a focus on only one kind of interaction that happens with digital media. So again, um, I'm a former academic and researcher and I got to support a ton of research so you're going to hear me reference a lot of studies. 
So in studying young people and how they participate online and with social media, we found that there are actually two very different kinds of participation that happen. And they're, they're, they're completely different. So one kind of participation is social, and it's what you just described. 95% of all of our kids are online participating in social media. And when we look at what they're doing, here's the thing about how they participate with social media. It is exactly what they do offline. Right? So if a kid bullies in face-to-face -face and offline world, they're going to bully online. If they cheat offline, they're going to cheat online. There's no difference. And so while we like to make it a big deal in the media, um, because it's happening with these new tools, it's actually the same behavior. And we need to be doing the same kind of parenting and education around that behavior, regardless of where it happens. But the second kind of interaction online, which we never talk about in the media or more broadly, is that about 10 to 15 percent of young people are online pursuing their interests. And there are these interest-driven groups online. You could be a gamer and you have a whole community that you're going online and they're helping you get better at something. I don't know if you know what fan fiction is or anime. Mm -hmm. Huge communities online where people who are interested in video production and in graphic design and in writing are going online and there's a whole peer community that's giving them enormous amounts of feedback. It's some of the best learning I've ever seen. And so when we have this general fear about our young people being involved with digital media, we have to be much more nuanced about it. We both, yes, we've got to educate them just as being good citizens and good human beings and take that online. But more importantly, we've got to teach them how to use the digital media to get better at things and to become makers and creators. And right now, only 10% of our population is accessing that. 90% it's out there and available, and they know how to be consumers, but not how to be participators, makers, and creators. And for me, that's the bigger problem. Not the fear about the use of digital media, but really, oh my God, let's get our kids be makers and creators and participating in these communities. Quizá lo más interesante de todo lo que estás diciendo es que al final el centro de... Maybe the most important thing that you're saying is to convey the enthusiasm uh, to children for everything. Generally speaking, it's true that uh, uh, children become enthusiastic uh, m much uh, sooner than adults. But it's true that although you said that learning has to go progressively, stop being a unique element uh, from schools or s uh, whatever, the teacher that will end up being a mentor is a key element in the passion for learning and in teaching children. But who's going to teach teachers to be mentors? A couple of ways to think about that. Um, and one of the other things that I want to say about sort of being fearful of our young people participating with digital media is that my bigger fear is that we as adults will abdicate our role in helping them to use the digital media for, for production and creativity. So when we say no to them, we're missing this incredible opportunity to, be, to participate with them in using the digital media for changing our world and for doing the things that they care the most about. So that's also a huge fear of mine. Um, and there is, on the, on the teacher front, there's a lot of criticism of teachers and not being willing to change or not being willing to take up the new digital media. And so there are a couple things, there are a couple parts of that that I think are really important. One is, I think we already ask too much of our teachers. I think they already are perform performing heroic tasks. And so if we want them to be a part of the shift, we've got to free them up and give them the opportunities and the resources to do it and not just keep asking it of them. And the second thing is, we all know whether we just know it intuitively or we know it from the research, that you can't teach something you haven't experienced. Right? You can't teach something that you've never been taught before. It's, it's, it's just not possible. And so in order for our teachers to shift to being mentors, they have to have the opportunity to learn. They have to be mentored. They have to be learning around the, the same kinds of skills and competencies and have those experiences so that they can then teach them. In some, way, in some way, what we are saying is that we are going to create our own uh, learning and the learning of uh, people to 
to which uh, to, to who are accompanying as mentors, so to speak. So this uh, learning concept, you were saying before that it evolves or that is permanent on time, it shouldn't end up, but we have the feeling that this endless uh, characteristic is an an ended uh, task, but well, I, I'm messing up myself. Just a minute. Well, I mean that we are very accustomed uh, into, for example, efficiency results, etc. We are accustomed to accomplish the goals, and when we've you have accomplished them, that's it, and you move to another goal. So this permanent learning that you are mentioning is a non-fulfillment feeling that you haven't uh, fulfilled your task. So how could we? make this into something that we understand, taking into account that we are who we are and we, we are where we are. Think again, think about a musician or think about an athlete. They're never, and I will confess that I sort of spent my entire adolescence trying to be a professional athlete. Um, you're never satisfied, right? You're always trying to get better. And you can both recognize your competency and it may be that you're moving different chairs in the orchestra. You can always recognize your competency and have those milestones and still be able to hold in your mind that there's more to do, that there's more to be, continue to get better at. And so I think we absolutely, um, let me back up and say, the other thing that we know about learning is that learning requires performance. And so we have to have those moments, we all do as learners, where we get to where we're performing what what we know how to do and the thing about performance is it's that moment when you actually consolidate everything you've learned and put it to work for you and so part of what we want to make sure that we're doing as we're building these playlists and these pathways is having to, to note those moments of when learning is happening and when performance is happening all of which is a part of learning but those performance moments are milestones that we can celebrate, we can honor, and that we will spend enormous, and our kids spend enormous amounts of time preparing for. So my son is in a play tonight. That's a moment of performance. He has spent the last three weeks memorizing his lines and practicing and learning and rehearsing. It's all going to come together for him tonight in his performance, and he'll have an incredible sense of accomplishment and still know that there's lots he can get better at. This is a point that we have to work on. It seems that we are in a society where it seems that passion uh, for new things ends up and we want easy results, so to speak. So the last session of Aspen and Tech Society had the presence of uh, Dario Hill from IBM that uh, talked about uh, artificial intelligence and this is a little bit controversial and, uh, but it's really exciting to uh, there are m a huge bunch of opinions, people find it very interesting and other people with this that you've said what well, seems that it involves there are other people that are scared of it. But you're saying that it is the next revolution, that it is already here. It is the world for which we have to prepare our children so that they have the competencies to, um, to make it. But how can we do not only the shift in learning to make it up, but also the shift in perception about the good things or the, um, the, the cautions that we should take? Uh, and, and I think part of it is that we have to, to all own a little bit of our own history. So every time we've had one of these shifts, it has terrified us as a society. So when we shifted from scribes to the printing press, actually society in that time thought that was a horrible thing. And we put all the scribes out of business, right? And we were terrified of what was going to get shared in books. Similarly, when we shifted to the radio, we were terrified of what was, going to get what was going to get shared through the radio. So every time we have a massive change in technology, we of course want to be conservative because change is hard. And so we have to keep reminding us that this has been our history. And that at the end of the day, I do think that we've advanced. And I'm actually a huge optimist about what having technology that makes us smarter takes care of efficiency so that we're not having to manage that, frees us up to be able to do in our lives and with our children. And so 
as long as we're building the infrastructure to support our young people to be prepared, I'm incredibly actually excited about what their future might be. But it's on us to actually, as adults, to do the work that we need to do to manage that fear and to be able to start thinking about the future for our kids. Mi última pregunta antes de invitaros a la... Well, last question before inviting you all to make questions. We've talked about spreading uh, this passion to children. We are speaking about a shift. What's more important, the personal shift of ourselves, the cultural or social uh, shift from other countries, or the uh, execution shift by governments uh, when uh, setting the education systems? The personal shift, cultural shift, or executive shift? There's all of them. <laughs> it, 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 if, in pushing, if you pushed me to say pick one, I think what's distinctive about the shift in artificial intelligence and its role in making the world smarter is that it really is going to make us understand and push hard on what's unique about us. And it's going to, I think that we have to have these, I think what's most important is our own personal understanding of what it means for us, what it means to be a learner, what it means to participate in the shift. And we have to have, we have to have these moments of reflection, and that's why these kinds of meetings are so incredibly important, because we have to take the time out to actually reflect on how we organize ourselves, how we think about ourselves, and what we want the world to be. Because artificial intelligence is just a tool, right? It's up to us what we're going to do with it and how we're going to make this shift happen. And we have to understand ourselves and our own needs and our own motivations in order to do that well. Tenemos preguntas? Do we have any question? Okay, so please take the floor. Muchas gracias. Eh, de hecho, tenía mucha... Thank you very much. I was really willing to listen to uh, uh, Connie because I have uh, following up uh, the learning in, in different cities in the United States, Philadelphia and so on. And I think it's uh, an experience and that is very promising for the reasons that she has explained, but there is another reason that I would like her to elaborate upon. Uh, and I think it has a huge potential to solve one of the main challenges uh, 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 in our society, which is the inequality in education. The uh, students in less privileged areas uh, with uh, not so many uh, educational resources that are so disconnected from school, which is the only place where they could learn something, and th those people are the ones who have less, fewer opportunities to open up to the world and to learn th different things. Uh, those are uh, schools that are also poor education wise so I think that precisely that uh, this initiative or the proposal that you are uh, presenting uh, goes hand in hand with the acquisition of new competencies but also about enriching the learning and educational opportunities uh, if these types of initiatives are trying to articulate the learning that takes place in some other places which are not the uh, schools it's, uh, themselves if they are well articulated and are accessible to all the uh, students they can be an opportunity for the lives of many young people who live, live in less privileged areas to flourish, to prosper, because it is not so much about uh, academic learning or knowledge, or, or uh, it's, it's about acquiring competencies, about learning how to do things by doing them, and that connects very much with the uh, um, anxieties and the concerns of many students. I know that it is a very complex project, uh, even the, the, uh, the batches that you were talking about for this exercise to uh, acquire value you have to create an environment that recognizes, acknowledges the value of those badges so that it is something real that serves some purpose or that opens uh, doors for you. So there are many challenges that we have to uh, finalize. But I think that it has a lot to do with a new educational paradigm, but it also has to do with solving something which is crucial, which is a different in access to uh, education on the part of these uh, uh, children, to the educational resources of the environment.
Yes, uh, it's a very interesting uh, remark. It is not just a question of preparing children, not for our world, but what, uh, for the world that is going to be theirs, uh, about uh, uh, making available real opportunities uh, to them and uh, to put them in the hands of those children. Because in order to learn, you only need to have the, the, the desire to learn. And of course, there are children that don't have so many opportunities in this physical world. And in the, with this connection, with this digitalization of the uh, organization of uh, learning will favor, for, of course, will foster the uh, creation of new opportunities for people in less privileged areas. I, I agree with you. Uh, very interesting. Uh, I have one question, uh, and if I can, two. Uh, and I was uh, uh, surprised, I I'm, I'm mostly agree with you, but uh, two or three times you said that we uh, wanted to help teachers at their schools or classrooms, when I think that, on the other hand, most of what you are proposing does not fit into a classroom. And the main problem in schools is nowadays the classroom itself. Those images that we saw with the small groups of young people so f concentrated in a, in a classroom, so that they are very interesting, but we might lose focus also. And we can uh, perhaps made, uh, might end, end up going back to the uh, classrooms. Uh, uh, the classroom, uh, it's... Uh, it's uh, it's the, that uh, room for a specific category for people with the same age who are treated the same and so on and we are doing the same with them or as a, 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 a room for lessons for delivering lessons and I think that's not really necessary I hope that this does not be, be, end up being an implosion in, instead of an explosion I think that the classrooms are too rigid for the diversity of children too rigid for for one single uh, uh, boy or girl, but also those personalization, customization experiences can be perhaps too broad for, for, a, for a professor, for a teacher, uh, even for a teacher who learns. And perhaps we should break with that uh, pattern of one teacher for so many children and one single space. And my, the second question, if I may. Uh, you have m uh, mentioned the scribes. The scribes were not very successful. They could uh, stop pr printing press for 20 years in Paris, but teachers were probably interested in books because books uh, made the task much easier. It was not the book itself, it was a textbook. Uh, the scribes were part of the, uh, those interested. The t teachers were another part, and the book might have displaced them, but not the textbook. The textbook was, was a formal of what they w did, what they wanted to do, and made class, uh, classes much easier, and that's why it exists today uh, still. Uh, and with technology, we might have the same possibility, using technology to reinforce the control of the classroom. There is no clear name for that, but what we call smart uh, classrooms, or LMS, uh, and those environments where the teacher controls everything, where the uh, students cannot even let their imagination fly because we know exactly at what, what they did at what point in time, that is also a risk. It is much more, uh, much, uh, more difficult to tame uh, technology vis-a-vis -vis what it was to tame the book. But I think that, that there is a risk that uh, uh, I don't think that digitalization necessarily is going to be an improvement. Connie, si quieres comentar algo. Connie, uh, what do you want to comment on that? Uh, there was a lot in that. Uh, so, so yeah. So there are a couple comments that I want to make, and that is that um, part of what we're learning from our work is both that it is incredibly important to innovate and experiment and really figure out a broader in innovation they talk about it as a north star really understanding where you want change to happen then you have to come back and begin to think about incrementally how do we implement this change right in sectors other than education we talk about disruption hmm. right and uber's disrupting taxis and airbnb is disrupting hotels but this is our these are our children Right? You don't want to disrupt the only place where our kids are learning right now because it's not clear, it's, it's too big a risk. And so on the incremental part and the work that we're doing in our cities is that we're actually building the playlists with our teachers 
that enable the teachers to do one portion of it, but then to very transparently be able to connect to a whole set of things that are happening around the city that can then connect to what they're doing in the classroom. So a teacher may be teaching, and it's very, we know that the textbooks, and particularly math, can be very linear and rigid. But if you can connect that to a set of community engagement projects that are happening in a much more informal and fluid way in the community, we can build playlists that connect those experiences. And so in that way, we're starting to open up the school to vary in a, in a smarter and easier way to connect to amazing things that are happening outside of the school. And so we have no intention of having something implode. We will incrementally enable things to get better while also continuing to experiment and to innovate. Um, so that, that's one thing that I would say. The other thing that I would say is that the technologies that you described, the learning management systems and other things, we, and I say this as an educator, we tend to bring technology into the existing classroom in ways that at best make them more efficient, but actually cr create the status quo over and over again. And so until we shift and think about the ways in which digital media change participation, production, and networking, which are at the core of learning, we will, we will, we will get little change at all from technology. And we'll all walk away saying technology doesn't matter for learning. Well, I would say that the way we use the technology doesn't matter for learning. We have to really start experimenting with how we use digital media to change the very learning experience. And we, and we just haven't done that yet in many of the classrooms that I suspect we're, we're talking about. We have a first question through Twitter, Mark Castro, who um, uh, uh, focuses on, uh, on the an, an ethic, uh, etiquette or on labeling. Um, I, I, I asks, uh, do you agree with the uh, uh, a statement, knowing us better and knowing more about digital plus passion and authenticity are going to be a value, uh, an added value in this te uh, technological society? So th it means within all these budgets, budgets uh, th the fact that you have a passion and that you have the knowledge of technology will uh, make you have an added value? If I understand the question, uh, yeah, I think it, it, it will have a, if you think about it from an employer's perspective, if, you, if um, and I, I run an organization, if you asked me, does a person who's coming to apply for a job have an incredible passion and an interest in what aligns with their work and an ability to learn and add skills, do I want to employ them? Yeah, I think it, it has a tremendous added value. Any other questions in the room? Pues, primero el que le he visto antes. <laughs> Hola, buenas tardes. Muchas gracias por... Hello, good evening. Thank you very much for the presentation. I think that uh, it could lead to a very interesting discussion. Anyway, my question comes from the perspective well, let me introduce myself. I'm, I'm a technologist, okay, because I'm going to say now. Uh, fr from the world of education, or basically now, we're putting into question what kind of education we have to develop, uh, the evolution of society, uh, as you've done in the beginning of your presentation. And the big question is where technology is going to. I think this is not the question for... Uh, in order to how to to teach people or how to yeah, we have to, they have to learn uh, the key question is what's the vision and the mission of humankind if we take this to the different countries from there we would be able to know what answers we have to give to that question let me put it in, in a specific context when you join a website of a government of an administration whatever the words that are devoted to society future education about vision and mission is zero 
they don't speak about the type of society that we want to build. So from there on, it's impossible to develop an, edu an education or a training program or uh, an education uh, policy, so to speak. Uh, there are very few countries where they have clearly defined what they want for, the, for uh, their society and how they want to raise their children to develop that uh, so, uh, future society. So that's a key point. From there on, we'll have uh, technology, get evolution, methods, etc. But uh, in order to know if, we, if there are going to be robots, what are they going to be the job positions, I don't care. For example, I'm an agricultural society. I don't care about a robot taking my job in Sudan, for example. My concern in Sudan in, um, is... Uh, I'm not concerned about uh, the artificial intelligence in Sudan. I'm concerned about the climate change, how the pollutants are going to affect my country, etc. So, um, just to, to wrap up, there's a very um, important point for me is the big digital gap because of the strong impact of technology. We are talking about um, scenarios that reach 5% of the world population. The rest of the world population does not have access to technology and even the access to the, to the wide band. So if you can't access this band, this broadband, sorry, uh, the, you, uh, I mean, it makes no sense because you don't have this access to the broadband to, broadband to work with this content. So this digital gap is a very concerning pro bro problem and it has, and it is affecting negatively uh, with, uh, to, to some countries compared to others. I would like to know your opinion. Actually, three pieces of things that you raised in that comment, and I really appreciate it. Um, first, I don't disagree at all that the thing that matters is our vision for who we want to be as humans and, and for our world. What I would add to that, though, is we've been having those kinds of conversations for thousands of years. We're, we're, we're not devoid of having that kind of a conversation, and yet this is, we have factory models for education. So we've developed our factory models for education in the context of we've been working. We're not... Philosophy is not new to us as a culture, right? And, but yet we still end up with these school systems. And so there are two parts of that that I think are, are, are why I organized my framing in the way that I did is that our economy is driving us. And so it's going to drive whatever our vision is, it's going to play an incredible role in what happens to our young people. So we've got to understand it. And the second thing is part of what makes us human is our ability to work with tools and the tools that we have it, we are humans in relationship to our tools and those tools determine in many ways how we relate and how we think right and so the pencil and paper has determined in so many ways what the educational experience looks like and so our understanding of what our future tool set is actually I think deeply matters to whatever the vision is so that's just how I would respond to that pushback just a little bit. And I don't think I agree with you on the uh, participation gap. I actually think that access to the internet is changing dramatically and will continue to change over the last five years. And, and we can disagree. <laughs> Vamos a terminar con la pregunta de la señora. So we're going to finish with the lady on the first row. Thank you. Okay, so thinking about the image that you have projected about the class in China with many students, uh, each of them on an individual table, and thinking about the fact that we can learn anywhere, how do you think that this change is going to affect the physical environment of learning? This is one of the, that's such an important question, and it's, um, Again, part of what we've learned from our research is that the best learning is social. The best learning is face-to-face. -face. And so if we continue to hold on and design for the user, if we design for the learner, not for the teacher or for the administration or for a set of accountability measures, but if we're designing for the user, we will design the learning experience, and I've seen this in a lot of the schools and environments that we're working in in the United States, the technology augments learning. It doesn't replace it. It makes those face-to-face -face interactions smarter and better when we use it well. And so I actually think that learning will continue to be face-to-face -face and as social as it is now, if not more so. 
Bueno, pues con esto tan importante que ha dicho Connie... Que... Ok, so with this last remark, the, the, the best learning is face-to-face -face learning, that technology does not replace what we know, but it can even improve it. I invite you to a couple of things. First of all, to come on the 19th of June to the next uh, se session of a Tech Society and to work all together to spread passion to our children passion to learn so that this learning is a lifestyle and not a task that they have to accomplish every day thank you connie thank you all the audience and we'll see you on the next one thank you